Welcome back! In this series, we've been talking about impossible Rubik's Cube arrangements. A Rubik's Cube arrangement is anything we can get from taking apart the pieces of a Rubik's Cube and putting them back together. An impossible arrangement is any arrangement that we cannot reach from the solved cube using legal cube moves. Last time, we were able to develop an accurate model of the Rubik's Cube using four pieces of information. A permutation of the corners, a permutation of the edges, an orientation vector for the corners, and an orientation vector for the edges. We then looked at the properties of the identity permutation which are preserved under all of the face moves of the cube. This gave us the fundamental theorem of cubology. A permutation of a 3x3x3 three by three by three Rubik's Cube is possible to reach from valid cube moves if and only if the permutation of the corners and the permutation of the edges have the same parity, there are an even number of flipped edges, and the number of clockwise rotated corners and of counterclockwise rotated corners are equal modular 3. But last time we ended with a question about different types of impossible cubes. Can we go from one impossible cube to another with legal cube moves? Today we will answer this question and get a peek at some important concepts in group theory. Let's get started. Take a look at these two cubes. Both are not solvable according to the fundamental theorem of cubology. The one on the left has an odd permutation for the corners and an even one for the edges. And the cube on the right has one flipped edge. Can we make the left cube look like the one on the right using only cube moves? Well, I can give it my best effort, but I'll never get it to work. We can show this with the same reasoning as we use to prove the fundamental theorem of cubology. The first cube has an even number of flipped edges. When we perform the cube moves, this property will be preserved. But the second cube has an odd number of flipped edges, so we can never reach this arrangement from the first cube. With this example, we can answer our question, there are different types of impossible cubes but it doesn't seem like we yet have the complete story. I wonder how many different types of impossible cubes there are. In order to answer this, we need to count all of the ways that an arrangement can fail the conditions in the fundamental theorem of cubology. The first condition requires that the permutation of the corners and the edges have the same parity. A given cube arrangement can satisfy this condition or it can have a different parity for the corner permutation and the edge permutation. Hence, this condition gives two possibilities. The second condition requires that there are an even number of flipped edges. Any cube arrangement can have an even or an odd number of flipped edges. Again, this gives two options. We can look at this from another perspective too, noting that the condition that there are an even number of flipped edges is the same as saying that the sum of the entries in the edge vector is 0 mod 2. So this sum can either be 0 or 1 mod 2, again giving us two options. Lastly, the third condition requires that there are an equal number of clockwise rotated corners and counterclockwise rotated corners modular 3. This is equivalent to saying that the sum of the entries in the corner vector, Vc, is congruent to 0 mod 3. Now any arrangement of the cube can actually have this sum be 0, 1, or 2 mod 3. This condition then gives three options. Now let's combine all of this information. The first condition gives two options. The second condition also gives two and the third condition gives three options. Thus, for any cube arrangement, we have two times two times three different choices. This gives 12 different types of cubes. Exactly one choice satisfies all of the conditions of the fundamental theorem of cubology. So there are 11 types of impossible cubes. 
So here we have an answer to our question. There are 11 distinct types of impossible cubes. But it seems that there's even more happening here. Let's put all of the cube arrangements of the same type in a box together. If two cube arrangements are the same type, then we can get from one to another with face moves. But we can also move between types of cubes by taking apart the pieces and putting them back together. So we have these two different types of actions, which allow us to either move within a cube type or between cube types. Notice that the face moves are actually just a special instance of taking apart the cube and putting it back together. That is, we could take all the pieces apart and then put them back together so it looks like we've performed a face move. So let's define a rearrangement of the cube to be an action of taking it apart and putting it back together. And we can always get from one arrangement to another via a rearrangement. But if we are only allowed to perform these special rearrangements, which are the face moves, then we get stuck inside of one type of cube. Okay, so let's zoom out in our picture. We will consider two cubes the same if we can get from one cube to another with face moves. So we really just need to choose a representative from each type of cube. And we can talk about moving from one representative to another via a rearrangement. This is actually a picture of something called quotient groups in group theory. I won't go into a lot of detail here because there's a lot of really good resources on YouTube if you'd like to learn about it. I recommend the Socraticus series and the Mathemaniac series. I'll link them both down in the description. We talked about a group in the first video, but a little reminder. A group is a set of actions that satisfies three properties. There is an identity or do-nothing action. Every action has an inverse action, and doing an action in its inverse is the same as doing nothing. And doing one action and then another action is in the set of actions. So the symmetric group, Sn, is an example of a group, where the actions are permutations. And we investigated this a lot in part one. Another example is the set of all rearrangements of the cube, as you might have guessed. We will call this the cube group. For those of you familiar with group theory, the cube group is isomorphic to S8 cross S12 cross 12 copies of C2 cross 8 copies of C3. If that's gibberish to you, don't worry about it. We will think of the cube group as our big universe. Right here, we'll place the identity element of the group, which corresponds to the solved cube. Now we consider applying face moves to the solved cube. This generates all of the solvable arrangements of the Rubik's Cube. We call this a subgroup of the larger cube group. But we know that not all arrangements are in the square. In fact, we have seen that this is only one twelfth of them. Now we add to the picture all of the representatives of the different types of impossible cubes. Each of these have their own set of cube arrangements that they can reach with face moves. And, as we have previously argued, these sets do not intersect. We call these cosets. If you look only at the representatives of each box and consider the arrangements that get you from one representative to another, then you're looking at the quotient group. The word quotient comes from division. As you can see, we have divided the pink box into 12 smaller boxes. Quotient groups are fundamental to many advanced topics in group theory, and as we have seen, they arise quite naturally in real-world situations. I definitely encourage you guys to learn more about group theory if you haven't seen it before, because it's a really fun and intuitive topic. Okay, well, we've come quite a ways over the past three videos. 
We started with permutations, the symmetric group, and permutation puzzles. Then we've learned about the fundamental theorem of cubology and why there are impossible cubes. Finally, we've learned about the different types of impossible cubes, the cube group, and quotient groups. Thank you for taking this journey with me. I hope that you enjoyed it. There are many more further questions to ask about Rubik's Cube, so I encourage you to explore on your own if you're interested. Thank you all for watching, and as always, keep exploring.